battery vibrated. And I felt that vibration come down from the seats, across the floor, up the raised stage, and through my feet. And in that moment, I realized I had caused this. Leah Matangelo had caused seismic activity in Southern California that morning. Let me click this here. Please don't tell Caltech because they get really touchy about this type of stuff. Next, I had rewritten my entire speech and I decided to address the big elephant in the room. There are 11 to 1200 students. There are 2000 teachers and parents and there are about 500 judges in this arena. You can imagine that each individual student is feeling pretty nervous in this sea of humanity. So I figured they were probably nervous. So I inquired, raise your hand if you're nervous right now. And all the hands of the student section pretty much rose up. I said, don't be nervous. Of all the people in this arena, you know your science fair project better than anybody. When the judges come around, just tell them what you did and what you know, and you will do fine. But I said, if you're still a little nervous, let me tell you a little technique I learned from a character actor here in Los Angeles by the name of Daryl Westbrook. Take the heels of your palms and push them together really tight. Go ahead, you can do it right now if you like too. And just relax your stomach and you just feel the energy dissipate as the butterflies fly away. And all day as I went up and down the aisles of the science fair, I saw these students pushing on their hands, waiting for the next judges to come by. But I felt I still need to calm them down a little bit. So I said, you know, even I get nervous when I have to speak. 20 minutes before I came on the stage, I found a back room that had a mirror. I was in there making sure everything looked good. I was practicing some of my opening lines when one of the students walked in and she was startled. She said, oh, you must be one of the speakers. I said, why, yes, I am. Said, oh, you must be really nervous. Oh, no, I'm a Toastmaster. I speak in front of audiences all the time. She looked at me quite puzzled and hesitating to say something. She finally did then why are you in the women's restroom? Well, that arena just erupted with laughter even stronger than before. Second time that morning, Leah Matangelo caused seismic activity in Southern California. Please do not tell Caltech. And then I decided to speak from the heart. I said, we, we live in a very entertainment oriented society where you kids, I know you see this, that actors and athletes, dancers, comedians, musicians, singers, they make a lot of money. But you, you guys know science and technology, engineering and math, and you are our future for tomorrow. You have made it to the California State Science Fair Finals. And that's something no one can ever take away from you. Put this on your resume forever. Remember that. This is something nobody can ever take away from you. And from the upper tiers of the sports arena started this applause. And a few seconds later, where the students were sitting, the applause was joined in as well. And this went on for a good 10 seconds as it crescendoed. And then it began to plateau. And as a speaker, 10 seconds of applause is a pretty long time. I stepped back from the microphone to let them have their moment. And that gesture of me stepping back gave them the permission to do it even longer. And it began to get louder again. And this applause went on for a good 25 seconds. I let them have their moment. Because to get to that science fair, it's a combination of the students, the parents, the teachers, and the mentors. It's a lot of people coming together to help these students get to that level. And I wanted them to have their moment, a science fair moment. But it was more than just that. It was a Toastmasters moment. And when I say Toastmasters, I mean the organization. I mean the program. I mean the individual member. One individual Toastmaster was able to move 3,500 people that day. I was able to use my voice to shake and wake them up. Thank you, Vocal Variety Project. I was able to rewrite my opening and my entire speech. Thank you, Table Topic Session.
I was able to make them laugh several times that morning. Thank you, humorous speech manual. Thank you, humorous speech contest. Thank you, humorous speech clubs. And I was able to move and inspire them. Thank you, Inspirational Project, and thank you, International Speech Contest. Toastmasters changes lives, and I know it changed my life that moment, that day. And I know I was able to change the lives of 3,500 people that morning. So my brothers and sisters, if you believe in the power of Toastmasters, can I get and amen. 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 All right, so today, I'm gonna to put my glasses back on. There's a glare that comes off of them. So I, I liked all the comments I heard of what you've picked up from, from these sessions. The sense of smell, why was that so important if you recall? The sense of smell is inside the middle part of our brain, the limbic system, and the limbic system is all about emotions. We have a multi-billion dollar industry that has been built on the sense of smell, the perfume industry, because it elicits emotions. And so that's why it became so important for us. Don mentioned that it was really important to write our speech to one person. And we learned that from Dr. Ralph Schmedley, our, our founder of Toastmasters. And the point of that was when you write to one person and you use the singular you instead of the plural you, everybody in the audience thinks you're talking straight to them. That's the importance of writing to one person. So get rid of those phrases in your speeches where you say, how many of you like the color green? And you do one subtle change and it has a profound difference. You change how many of you to do you, and that becomes the singular you. Do you like the color green? The entire audience knows that when you say how many of you, that the speaker is talking to the collective audience. When you say do you, the individual audience members know you're talking straight to them. And we'll talk about this a little bit further. So those are all great nuggets. You're absolutely right. 10 words or less is what we go for, a message to our audience. Everything else we do as a speaker is to engage and bring them in and to entertain them. And when you do that effectively, your message will be received by that audience. All right, so great, great nuggets. I liked all of them that you, were, you brought up. Today, we're gonna talk about connection. We're gonna talk about connection. Darren LaCroix, I, were you there a week and a half ago, Becky? At, the Laugh Laugh Story Masters, right? We had Darren LaCroix come and he talked about storytelling. And one of the key takeaways, Becky, was it was all about connection. It's all about connecting with the audience. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So, Zim, I don't know if you want to go ahead and kick up the PowerPoint. And we're going to talk about connecting with our audience. Second there. Okay. All right, so the first one we're gonna do, it's a little acronym called Just Love Fads. Just Love Fads. And there are nine contrasting pairs of emotions that speakers should invoke to an audience. So the first one, the J stands for joy. Of course, if you talk about joy to an audience, they're gonna like that. A lot of times we start talking about the sadness in our life, the sadness in our life. And when we get to the advanced techniques, we're gonna talk about storytelling. And in storytelling, there's usually a conflict that's the whole point of the story. There was some conflict that happened. And if there's gonna be conflict, there needs to be a resolution. And so the conflict would be sadness. At some point in the speech, you have to show that you've now attained joy. And now you have the resolution. The journey from sadness to joy, you're gonna learn some lesson that you're gonna to give to the audience. So the next letter is U. And the U stands for uncertainty. 
And there's different types of uncertainty that we have in our lives. There's anxiety, there's anticipation, there is, right? There's going to be suspense and there's gonna be doubt. Those are types of uncertainty. And so let's go on to the next slide, Azim. And in there, when you have these uncertainties, there's also the counterpart. So what's the uncertainty of, of anxiety? It would be like being in a, a peaceful state, right? And then what's the next one? We have anticipation. We're anticipating something. Maybe we're waiting for our doctor's results to come back, or maybe we're waiting for the results of a test we took, right? We have these anticipations. So these are emotions that a lot of people will identify with. Okay, you wanna go on to the next one, Zim? Okay, the next one we have S is going to be surprise, right? Surprise, the opposite of surprise is- Sorry for interruption, we can't see the slides. Yeah, we're not, you're stuck on 17, Zim. You wanna to proceed to 18? I'm not sure what's um okay, I think she's gonna re-kick that off. But while she's doing that, we'll, we'll go on to the next one. We'll, we'll catch up with the slides. So the S stands for surprise. So what's a surprise in your life, right? A surprise is you have calm in your life, then something surprised you, right? So surprise is an emotion that we that we identify with a lot. So here's the other ones above. You know, anxiety, you're comfortable, anticipation, you're complacent, suspense. You were ap apathetic and doubt you had confidence, right? Is the opposite of doubt. Okay. So surprise calm. Let's move on to the next one. We're gonna jump over love and we're gonna go. Oh, we have we have T, we have trust. This is a big one, right? This is a big one that a lot of people identify with. And usually what has happened is they have had to deal with deceit. Some of that they trusted did not give the trust that we expected. We were deceived. And so in order for that to get resolved, trust has to be regained again. So that's a big one. This is what the 2012 World Champion of Public Speaking talked about, Ryan Avery. Trust is a must, okay? And that was the whole point of his speech. So let's move on. So the acronym is Just Love Fads. We're gonna go on to fads and we'll come back to love and we'll, I'll show you why we're gonna do that. So with the F, we have fear. This is another big one that we have in life. I think that's a big reason why most of us join Toastmasters, is it not? We had the fear of standing before an audience. We had the fear of public speaking. We had the fear that we're gonna be up there and we're gonna forget our speech and we're gonna look foolish. So this is a big emotion that your audience will identify with. People have fears of all sorts of fears in life. And the opposite of that would be courage. And that's what we do in Toastmasters. We get up in front of the audience, we make this area be our, our comfort zone. And when we do that, we have the confidence and we have the courage to do it again. So the next one is an A, anger. Anger is another big emotion that we all identify with. And the opposite of that would be just serenity. So you people who talk about anger in their speeches, we need to see them get to serenity by the end of their speech. That's the resolution of the conflict of anger. And the next one we have is disgust. How many times have we been disgusted by people in our, in our community, in our society, driving down the freeway? People that we work with, they do stuff that is just, they disgust us with their behavior. We want, we want to be pleased. So that's the opposite there. And the last one is S, which is sorrow. Sorrow is when we're feeling incredible sadness the loss of a friend, the loss of a pet, the loss of a family member. We feel that grief, that sorrow, and the opposite of that would be bliss. Okay, so these are emotions that really touch an audience. But then there's the big emotion, the big emotion of love. Love, I love Linguini, I love computers, I love basketball, I love Toastmasters, I love my job, I love my dog, I love my cat, I love my parents, I love my brother, I love my significant other. I love mathematics. In every one of those statements, the word love meant something different. And in that regard, the English language is deficient because we have just that one word, love. 
but in the Greek language, I have identified at least nine words for love. And let's look at those. We'll start with the first one, agape. Agape is the spiritual love that we have between God and man, man and God. Spiritual love. The opposite of that would be not having any love of God at all, which would be atheistic, right? Then we have pathos. In pathos, we get the word passionate, but the word pathos from the Greek language means something very, very special. If you remember, Mel Gibson had a movie called The Passion of the Christ. And that word passion is the passion that we're talking about that comes from pathos. And passion is when you realize that Jesus Christ was the Son of God and that he has died for all of human sins, but it was humans that caused him to die. And that's pathos, is when you realize what we have done as humans to the Son of God and feeling that shame because he is now dying for us, but we caused him to die. It's the greatest irony that we've ever experienced. So that's where pathos comes from, and that's the passion that we talk about. Then we have storge. All mothers know this word. This is this is that familial dependent love. We have to take care of our newborn. If we don't take care of them, they will surely die. We have to feed them, we have to bathe them, we have to change them, we have to touch them and give them love. And that's storge, okay? A very strong dependent love. Then we have philos. Philos is that other familial love between siblings, even brothers in arms or peers, right? This is where we have this love between our brothers or if we're in the war situation, we protect those who are in the foxhole with us. And there's this strong philos bond. And we have that city in America called Philadelphia, right? IA means the place of, Delphi means brother, and philos means familial or brotherly love. And that's the, that's the motto of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. That's what the word actually means from the Greek. Then we have philaudia, and this is a very important love. It's self-love. It's like the mask dropping in the airplane. You have to put that mask on first before you can help anybody else. Because if you try helping other people and you can't breathe yourself, you're not going to do any good to the other people. Same thing with philaudia. We must love ourselves first before we can love anybody else. So a very important love, philaudia. Now, obviously, the opposite of that is we self-loathe. And then ludus. Ludus is when we start to engage with other people. Ludus is this playful togetherness love, flirting going out with a group of people when you're in school, to movies or to dances. It's this playful type of love. So ludus is very important. And then we have pragma. Pragma is the long lasting love, the long standing love. And the opposite of that is having one night flings, acute love. And we learned all about pragma in Randy Harvey's 2004 World Championship speech. It is the most powerful of all the stories that he told. He told seven stories in his six minute and 50 second world championship speech. And it happened to be the shortest of all the stories he told. And the power line was, boys, real men love for a lifetime, not just a moment. There are mothers all over the world that have come up to Randy Harvey and told him that they made their teenage or young adult son watch his speech just to hear that line, that real men love for a lifetime, not just a moment. That is pragma. And then there's mania, obsessive or lust, right? Women have this mania for shoes. Men have this mania for cars, right? Women can't get enough shoes. Oh, men can't have enough of the, the cool car, right? So that's the mania, this obsession. And the opposite of that would be the phobia, the fear of something, all right? And then we have the last one, which is eros, eros, sensual, intimate love, the love that spouses have, right? Very intimate, sensual love. 
And the opposite of that would be very prudish, where you don't want anything to do with that kind of love. So with the Greeks, we get nine different types of love. In English language, it's very different, right? Surely I don't love a plate of pasta the same way I love my brother. Surely I don't love my dog the same way I love my car. And surely I don't love the number 13 the same way that I would love my parents. So we have that deficient word love in English. We use it many different ways, but the Greeks gave us a lot more specificity. So bring that into your, into your speech is love is a very powerful emotion that audiences will always identify with. So just love fads. We have joy, we have uncertainty, we have surprise, we have trust, we have fear, we have anger, we have disgust, and we have sorrow. And then we also have all the opposites, and we have those nine words for love. The 2005 world champion of public speaking, Lance Miller says, connection is more important than perfection. It's more important for you to connect with your audience than it is for you to say all your words exactly right and pronounce them exactly correct or, or have a small stumble on some of your words. The connection to the audience is much more powerful than being a perfect speaker. Okay, so let's remember that. Let's move on to the next, the next slide, Zim. We have 12 minutes here before we take our break. Let's keep on plugging through. Here we're gonna talk about what the audience wants to get from us as a speaker. Okay, connecting with our audience. And we call this cake piece. Look at that beautiful piece of cake there. That's the acronym, Cake Piece. Okay, connecting with our audience, we're gonna talk with the first one. And it's the first one is the C, capture, capture your audience attention, right? I tried to do that at the beginning of my speech with that Southern Baptist minister's voice, right? We all remember Darren LaCroix's opening. Very early in his speech, he falls on his face, literally, as he talks about falling on his face in life. What a very strong capturing of the audience attention. As he worked with his speaking coach, Mark Brown, who had won in 1995, Darren wins in 2001. Mark Brown tells Darren to stay down. Don't get up right away. So Darren stays down there and he continues to talk to the audience while he's flat on his face. And Darren says to Mark Brown, he says, but the audience is going to start feeling uncomfortable. And Mark Brown says, exactly. That's exactly what we want them to feel, uncomfortable. And eventually, Darren jumps up and says, ouch. That's the title of his speech. And he brushes off his knees and he says exactly what the audience is thinking. Do you think I stayed down too long? And then the audience feels the release because they were thinking that. And, and Darren has to tell them what they're thinking. Now he has this connection with them. And then comes the power line in his speech. Have you ever stayed down too long? Within the first minute of that speech, Darren LaCroix wins the world championship of public speaking. He'll tell you that, but staying down, falling on his face, He's in the top three. By staying down extra long, he wins the contest. And it's so true. We don't care what happens at the, at the rest of that speech. He tells us stuff, he, he goes through, he makes us laugh, but that opening captured us and it won the world championship for him. So connect with your audience on a level that is connecting with them. Do something extraordinary. Let's go on to A. What's the A? The A is to attract the audience with your aura. It all starts with, if you're doing a speech and you have an introduction of yourself, you write that introduction. And then you stand up from your seat, wherever you are in the audience, and people start looking at you. You should be looking like a speaker, putting on your best suit, your hard shoes, right? You go there with a great posture and a great sense of, co of confidence. You're smiling. You shake the hand of the person who just introduced you. Your attitude, your authority, your audacity, 
your overall aura should be attracting the audience. I want to listen to this speaker. That's what you're going for there. Then we go to K. Don't just attract the audience, keep the audience all the way through your speech, not just at the opening. And like what we've done in this workshop, I didn't just stand here for two hours and talk, talk to you. That would put you guys to sleep. We had polls. We had exercises for you to do. We got you standing up. We interacted with you. So you always keep your audience attention by shaking up what you do in your presentation. It's easy to do a seven minute speech, but when you do a longer speech, you have to break it up and let the audience do different activities. Okay. So keep the audience attention throughout. Always remember that. And someone mentioned as Zim was asking what the nuggets were. Remember to do dialogue instead of monologue. Even though we may be the only ones speaking, it's always dialogue through our eyes, looking at the audience to make sure that they're engaging with us. Just like I did at the Los Angeles Sports Arena. I had a whole speech prepared. It wasn't the speech I delivered. I could have gone and delivered my speech. And if you notice the first three speakers before me, all said, give yourself a round of applause for being here. I never, I never asked them to do that. They gave their own round of applause when I touched them and I made a connection with them with the words, right? So always try to keep the audience's attention. Then the last one is E, entertain your audience. We've talked about this over and over in this workshop. Use humor, use comedy, use singing. We saw Camille sing, figures of speech, storytelling, drama, human interest stories like Florence Chadwick, the swimmer, who taught us that we better have our goals visible or we'll never attain them, right? Do excerpts from literature and poetry. All of this will entertain the audience. Incorporate those into your speeches. And now let's go on to the piece. The P is for personalize. And we just talked about this. Personalize your speech to each individual audience member. Whenever I talk about connecting with the audience, I want you to connect with each individual person in the audience. And we do this through the singular you, not the plural you. Talk to them directly. If I'm talking to a thousand people and I say, do you like the color green? All 1000 people in that audience thinks I'm talking straight to them. And I've just made a connection with 1000 people. This is so important to do this. Remember, write your speech as if you're writing it to one person, not an entire group of people. Because if I was writing my speech and I was giving it to Becky Fisher, I wouldn't say to Becky, how many of you like the color green? No, I would say, do you like the color green? Practice with one person and do it the exact same way as Don said to the rest of your audience. Okay, let's move on to I. I is infatuate your audience. Make them like you, even love you. And I think I mentioned this once before, the number one TED Talk by Sir Ken Robinson. We start liking this guy as he is talking through his 18 minute TED Talk. We start liking him, we want him to be our friend. We want, we want to be around this guy all the time. He's a great storyteller. I want to hear more stories from Ken. And by the end of the speech, you know, I'm a, a true blue heterosexual American male. I was in love with this guy in a different way of love. We just talked about all the different ways. I wanted this guy to be my friend. I wanted to hear more from him. So make, make the audience get infatuated with you, like you, and even love you. And we do this. We do this through entertaining them, using our wit, going to excerpts of poetry and literature, telling stories, being humorous, being comedic. Okay, let's move on to E. Let's make our audience evaluate, right? We evaluate our audience continuously. I just mentioned that with our eyes. We continue to evaluate as we do this dialogue with them. Okay, it's dialogue, not monologue. Let's go on to C, and C is going to be connect. Continue to connect. And I mentioned this already, Lance Miller, connection is more important than perfection. Make the connection. And lastly, exercise the audience. Mentally, right? Remember, we, we ask them questions, we're asking them. Mentally, they have to be stimulated. Sometimes we get up, we have them get up and do something physical, 
we could do improv exercises. We did the exercise with the posture where we had people bend over. So mentally and physically exercise your audience. It makes the, it makes the overall presentation more dynamic. It gives them something to do, okay? Any questions on these last two, these last two sessions we just went through, connecting with the audience or cake piece, right? Okay. If not, can you repeat the slide, please? Just show the slide, the last slide again, please. Sure, sure. Go ahead. Go ahead, Zim. Okay. Hi, Lee. This is Kirti. I have a question sure, about, about the nine kinds of love. Yes. So I was wondering if there's, you know, some of them maybe more effective than others in a speech, perhaps. Can you can you talk about that? Well, so it, it all depends, right? I, I would say there's different types of love. I mean, the pragma one. I mean, obviously rocked a lot of people around the world because as Randy Harvey goes around the world, it, he, you know, I, I got to meet with Randy Harvey uh, one night for about three hours. I got to interview him. And so he tells these stories. And I think that was pretty powerful that women all around the world said, I made my teenage son or I made my young 20 something son watch your speech just to hear you say that real men love for a lifetime. So of course, pragma, long lasting love. We take vows in churches when we get married. We, we do it in front of God. We do it in front of family. We do it in front of friends. And those vows should mean something, right? So that's a very powerful love. But I think all of them in their own right, if you tell a story about them, the audience will identify with them. Just think about philaudia, self-love. So many people worry about loving other people that they forget to love themselves and they let themselves go. My brother is a classic example. My brother is a pastor. And he takes care of his flock, but I don't see him taking care of himself. He's put on weight. He, he gets really tired and he, he, he needs to take care of himself. So Philaudia is a very powerful love that we should talk about. Storge, familial love. You know, we, we know that the, the, the little baby birds have to be taken care of by the mother bird. When children are born into this world, the mother takes care of the child for many years. Because the child, if, if you left that child alone, would die, right? We have to feed them. We have to take care of them. We have to bathe them. We have to change them. We have to touch them. We have to let the baby feel mother's heartbeat. So all of these different types of love are very powerful. Camille is in a religious Toastmaster club, and I'm seeing more and more of these clubs popping up. So talking about agape would be very powerful for that, for that club as well agape and pathos the real definition of pathos right i mean if you talk about buying shoes women in this audience would fall over they'd be they'd give you attention so mania is powerful very powerful if you talk about hockey sandy malone is going to wake up right so it's it's all good okay so I, i'm not going to say any one of these loves is, is more powerful than the other the story that you create around those different types of love is what's going to sell that that type of love and they're all very powerful and there might even be more words in the greek language these are just the ones that i've identified with and unfortunately for us in the english language we just have that one word and we use it so often that it almost demeans right loving a plate of linguine is very different than someone loving their spouse right but yet we use the same word so I would say, Curdy, if there's any one of those that you like, talk about it and, and develop it and bring it to life and the audience will love it. See how I use that word again? All right, any other questions? So Ned, go ahead. Yeah, since we are on this slide of the love uh, in the Greek culture, you know, in literature, we read sometimes about the Platonic love. Okay. Platonic, referring to Plato, the philosopher. Sure. So where do you categorize this love in the nine loves you mentioned? You know, I might have to add a, a tenth one now, Ned, that you mentioned. <laughs> yes. um, I'll have to look at where, 
Yeah, the word comes from Plato. I wonder why they call yeah. it love. Uh, that's, that's because it's a love between man and woman, but it's without lust. Correct. It's very spiritual, but it's uh, it's not man and God. It's it's man and woman, but it's very spiritual love. Right. And, and on that note, Ned, I think it even changes from between man and woman uh, with the with the we no longer have the binary gender system in our society. Right. We have all these different types of of sexual orientation now. Right. The last I heard was LGBTQIA. Right. So those are all different types of love, the A meaning asexual. So platonic love could be between two guys that are just really good friends, but they love each other. For example, if Ken Robinson was my friend, I would have a platonic love with this guy that it's, you know, it's not sexual, but I like this guy so much. I want to be around him. It doesn't mean, so I think today's word, I think back when it probably was between man and woman and they could have a relationship that was not built built on any sensual erotic love, right? But I think today we morph all of our words because the way our society morphs. So but I'm going to look into Platonic. I might have to- Yeah, but just to add something, I think the uh, Platonic uh, love, it's mainly about the relations between sure. any two lovers that they cannot connect for some reasons. Okay. You know, sometimes it happens in life, like there are two persons, they fall in love with each other, but they can't connect. If you know, lucky they can't get married, for instance, for any reason. So they still have the passion. It will be there forever, but it cannot be expressed. It cannot be satisfied, if you know what I mean. This is the platonic love. And it, it's, it's painful. It's again, it's more poetic thing than reality, in my opinion. But we read about it always in the, in the literature, as you know. Right. So, yeah. Ned, I think you just figured out the next speech you're going to write and you tell the audience about it. <laughs> so for example, I know I've known Becky Fisher for many years now. I yeah. think we would have a platonic love. I met her husband, right? Yeah. So we're not going to have anything more than that, but we can yeah. love each other on a certain level that it, it's mutual respect. It's a love, but we'll never take it to some other level. Yeah. Right? So, Oh, it's complicated. I like the I like what Curdy put in the chat. Okay. Yeah, it is. It's okay. All right. Any other questions on anything we've talked about? So connect with your audience, right? Try to connect. So here's what we're talking about in this workshop. We write our speeches, and a lot of people wrote, wrote their speeches, and they would get in front of an audience, and they would just say the words. What I'm trying to tell you in this workshop is master all those foundational topics of being confident working with words, using your voice, being physical, the way you dress, the way you move, the, your, your gestures, all that are layers that you keep putting on your speech. And I want you to have fun with this. Eventually you get to figures of speech. Start looking at the words you wrote and try to put other levels of how you would say it with figures of speech or putting humor, putting comedy in your speech. We continue to morph the speech to make it a lot more dimensional than just the words that we initially wrote. And that was the whole point of the vocal variety exercise that we did, that our voice is so powerful that we don't use it just to say the words of our speech. We use it to make the emphasis of the meaning of the words. And then when we got into alliteration and the phoneme and the poetry, we use our words to make it more lyrical and more exciting for the audience. And there's an art form to be doing humor and comedy, and it's all about how we say it. So our speeches are not just the words. That's just so one dimensional. It's a lot more than that. And so you bring it to life. And when you now have your speech down, I want you standing on the stage, not worried about your words, but looking at your audience and trying to connect with them as you have your speech that is now second nature. The words, your, your movements, your gestures, I want all that to become second nature. You now need to be connecting with the audience. Why? because we're trying to give them the message. That's the whole point why we're up there. Everything we else we do, I call it a rhetorical device. It's all centered around helping to deliver that message. And that's what we're trying to do in this workshop. So pull the handouts out when you write your next speech. I'm not ex expecting you to memorize this stuff, but over time, you will start to memorize them. I've given you little acronyms that you can use to help you. But as you go through, this stuff will become second nature. And you can just do it as you write your speeches. So on that note, we're a few minutes over now. Let's go ahead and take a take a break. We'll take a five-minute break. We'll come back at 8, 11, 8, 12. 
And then if you think of any more questions over the break, we can answer those at the beginning and we'll move on. Okay, let's take a break. shorter amount of time with my voice than what I would do as a writer. So I would say, try to find people that you admire as a speaker. You can even reach out to some of the world champions and they talk to them, right? You'll get more out of a session with them than I think you would get out of a book, right? You know what, uh, just to share with you my, my opinion, I might be mistaken. I have seen speeches for several world champions and a lot of them, in my opinion, I might be mistaken, and I hope I'm mistaken. They are like one-time winners. They are. If you know what I mean. There are one-trick ponies, and there are other people. Exactly. They are one-time winners, but I mean, they can make, I don't know how they can reach. It's good speeches, but after that, I don't know. Uh, they can't make it again. Okay. If you know what I'm saying, yeah. Which means they don't have the knowledge and experience to keep doing it over and over and over. Well, okay, so I'll give you the names of the ones you'd want to reach out yes, to. Yes, tell me, please. Absolutely, you don't want to go to everybody. So Mark Brown, who's Mark Brown. Man, Darren LaCroix. Mark Brown and Darren LaCroix do a lot of s webinars every week, every other week. Um, Sorry, Darren, want to give me his last name? Mark Brown and Darren LaCroix, L-A. Oh, LaCroix, I know, I know Darren, okay. Okay. In my view, the best of all the world champions is Randy Harvey. He oh, yes. He mentored the 2012 winner and he mentored Mohammed Katani. Talk about a capturing opening. Mohammed Katani comes out on the stage and he starts to light a cigarette. And he says, What? You think this causes secondhand smoke cancer? I and know Mohammed Katani personally. I, I, I worked with him in a project in Saudi Arabia, in the desert. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's working for Aramco. Okay. Well, Saudi Aramco, the oil company. <laughs> I know it. So contact uh, Mohammed Katani. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so he was mentored by Ra by Randy Harvey. Randy Harvey. I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So those guys are good. Oh, uh, yeah. So yeah, Lance Miller. He's a big a proponent of Toastmasters. Mm. You can bring him in, and he'll talk about Toastmasters. He's got Finding Your Voice. These are really good speakers. I see. Now, Craig Valentine in 1999. I didn't like any of the speeches that won. So mm. Craig Valentine wins. I didn't care who they gave it to. Craig mm. Valentine will tell you this story. Soon the story after, of what? He's going to tell you the story. The story is after he won, oh. his, his company contacts him to come and deliver a keynote to the entire company. Mm. They give him a first class plane ticket. They pick him up at the airport in a limousine. They take him to a five star hotel. Yeah. They take him to a uh, dinner, a five-star restaurant. They take him back to the hotel. The limo picks him up the next morning, takes him to the company, and he goes to deliver to all the employees of the company, and he bombs. And because he didn't know why he won in 1999, from oh. then on, he went to figure out how to win. He is now one of the best speaking coaches I've ever seen. We brought him to our district several times. Yeah. He's very engaging, very he connects with his audience. But see, he, he had to learn the hard way, right? Some people win and they don't know why they won and they don't pursue it anymore. But he wanted to be a great speaker and he, he figured out what happened. I, I looked him up the other day. He makes he's worth $15 million right now. Wow. I had his book. And I read a big part of it, but I found it it's more about sales and marketing okay. than about marketing, about public speaking, you know? <laughs> okay. Well, so, exactly. So he won in 1999. Ed yeah. wins in 2000. Darren LaCroix wins in 2001. Mm. And they hook up with Patricia Fripp, who's yeah. a very well-known public speaker for years. I mean, she does C-level corporations and gets paid a ton of money for that. So all of them went around doing the lady and the champs. And they mm -hmm. had these workshops, okay? Now Mark Brown's involved <clears throat> and a couple other people. So yeah, they're, uh, those are some of the better people, but they do sell their product and they sell their services. Mm -hmm. So you have to be careful about that. Yeah. All right. Okay. Let's go on today. We're, we're gonna talk about evaluation. Now evaluation's very 
important, right? We is one third of our Toastmaster meeting. So we'll go over it very quickly. Um, but I think we should do a whole session on this. And this is where we bring in a couple of test speakers and then we go through the process. So I have a handout that you could get. It's called Effective Evaluations Blank the Speaker. Let's fill in the blank. What do we do to a speaker when we evaluate them? What are some keywords? Go ahead, take yourself off mute. Right? Motivate. Motivate. So Vivek gets motivate. What else do we do? Encourage. We encourage. Okay, great. What else do we do? You guys are doing them in order. Guide. You, you guide, guide them in guide, suggestions okay. for improvement. Yeah. Guide. Yeah. Help. Right. We we sometimes show if we are experienced evaluators, like I am coming from an advanced Toastmaster club specialized in evaluation. Okay. So we usually focus on showing the weakness okay. and the strength of the speech. Okay, very good. So we heard other ones. We have a D that sounds do not criticize. When we evaluate, we never criticize. Okay, I is to inspire the speaker and C is to coach them. So these are what we do. The primary goal of the evaluator is what? Primary goal of the speaker is to deliver a message. What's the primary goal of an evaluator, a speaker evaluator? If you, if you learn and remember this primary purpose, you will always be a great evaluator. It's to get the speaker back up to speak again, period. Okay, we, we, we attract more flies with honey than with vinegar, don't we? Okay, so we just went through the medic. We heard motivate, we heard encourage, do not criticize, inspire coach. So that's the medic approach. And getting back to what, what Ned said, we want to build up the speaker. So what I do the next is I say as many positives as I can about the speaker, and then I focus in only on two or three areas for improvement. Okay, so how do we do this? So the first thing is we learn the primary goal, which is to get that speaker back up to speak again. We talk to the speaker prior to the speech, right? Next, we're going to familiarize ourselves with the speaking attributes and the old manuals, the legacy manuals were great. The CC manual was perfect. Confidence, how to organize, how to speak in earnest, how to use words, how to do vocal variety, how to do the physical presence of ourselves. Right, all of that was in that CC manual. So then we create a form. We create a form that has all these attributes on it. Well, you don't have to worry about creating the form. It's in the handout when you when you get it. So go ahead and move on, Zim, and move on again. Okay, now we have the checklist. We can take that form. In the evaluation contest, there was nothing in the rules that said you can't bring a form with you as the, the, the evaluator, the contestant evaluator. And so I would bring my form and I would evaluate my my contestants i would evaluate the test speaker when we're all done evaluating we then go through the list of these of all this on the form and we prioritize right we're going to go through all of what we've written and say we're going to put a p against everything that was a positive attribute and we're going to put an i against everything that was an area for improvement we still have a huge list there's 15 items on my form. We probably cannot talk about all 15 of those items in the two to three minute evaluation as we're doing the speech contest or as we're evaluating someone in the club. So now we have to go through and prioritize for every P, go through and the ones you think are the most important, you put a second P by that, that, that item on the list. And for all the I's, the, the two or three that you are think are going to be very important, you put a second I there. So now you've, you've, Put your list, you writ, writ, wrote out all of the comments that you want to make, either they're positive or they're improvement co comments, and then you've now prioritized. You have probably about eight or 10 that have two Ps, and you can rattle those off very quickly, but don't just tell them what they did that was well. You want to give them the why. It's important for them to keep doing it. It's the why that teaches the speech the speaker is the why that teaches the audience. And when you're in a speech contest for evaluation, you are teaching the judges. And when the judges felt like you taught them, they're going to give you extra points as an evaluation contestant. Okay. So now you deliver your two to three minute speech, build up that speaker at the beginning, tell them how great they are. 
and then give them two or three areas for improvement. We take little baby steps in Toastmasters as we improve. We try to do 10 improvements in one speech. We stumble, we fall, and it hurts. So we, we limit it to two or three, okay? And then we deliver the evaluation. And at Vivek Garg, he does the, the Bothell the Bothell Gavel Club, the, the, the young kids, and we did a whole one hour and a half session with those guys, and that's how we can really teach this, right? So here I'm just giving you the high level. All right, let's go on to the next one, uh, Zim. Um, here we go, yeah. When we deliver the evaluation, we make sure that it's personal from your perspective, right? And, and one other major point is don't do a speech evaluation you do a speaker evaluation, right? We didn't join Toastmasters to become speech writers. We joined Toastmasters to become better speakers. It's the ones who decide to go down the competition path that now have to be speech writers as well, okay? So there can be very novice speakers. I tell them, hey, if you don't know what to, 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 to write about, go take an excerpt from literature, do poetry, and bring it to life with your voice and your mannerisms. And you can learn how to do that without having to write the speech, right? So we are speaker evaluators. Evaluate the speaker so whatever speech they do next, you've given them something to improve themselves on so they can be a better speaker the next time they speak. And we do this sandwich method. We list as many proficients, those were all the Ps, that you can build them up describe up to three areas for improvement and then summarize in the contest the judges are looking for you to summarize so hit the key proficient attributes that you want them to keep doing and give them the key areas for improvement and leave them on a positive note okay beautiful be positive let's do another handout here we have another one if you didn't like this one here's the form i put together you on the form you have space after each one of these write something about about each one of these items as you're evaluating your speaker in the club or you're evaluating during a speech contest. And if you want to take, take this and add additional attributes to look for, take some of these away if you don't wanna talk about them, but create a form and have that form. And this form has proven well for me because I've won two different districts now at the district level evaluation contest, district one and district two. So this is the method I use. It's all about teaching the audience with the whys of what you talk about on these different attributes, okay? Say, I love the fact that you wore a great suit, and here's why that was important. I love the fact you didn't use the lectern and notes, and here's why that is important, right? Now think about this form. You can, you can already write what you wanna write about each one of these concepts before the contest or before you even go to a Toastmaster club. You know why we want to get rid of the lectern and notes, right? So write some comments about that. You go into this like a lawyer going into a courtroom. Whether or not they use the lectern or not, it's either going to be a positive or an area for improvement, right? And you know what you're going to say. If it's an area for improvement, you say exactly what you would have said. I like the fact that you didn't use the lectern and notes for this reason. You use lectern and notes. I want you to remove those for your next speech and start getting out of the habit of having to have notes, and here's why it's important. You now remove that encumbrance in. You are now right in front of the audience. You're no longer having to look down at notes, so you're always having eye contact with the audience. All of these are positive reasons why you don't want to use lectern and notes. You teach the audience the why of these attributes, and you will win. You will be a winning evaluator. Okay, let's move on, Zim. Any questions on any of this so far? Pretty, pretty basic, pretty straightforward. Here's another, go ahead and just pop up all the points here. Uh, question. Yeah. Sorry. yeah. You mentioned that we should evaluate the speaker, not the speech. Right. I don't know, maybe we need to. Okay, let me, let me elaborate that. You okay. evaluate the speech only if you're going to evaluate the content to make the speaker better, right? You have to judge your, the speaker that you're doing. Obviously, when I am coaching people who are being contestants in contests, I am talking a lot about the content, okay? This is all about you evaluating people. You have to realize who they are. If you're in a club and you have a new Toastmaster, 
They are just trying to learn these techniques. You're not going to get too much into the content unless it's going to help in terms of how they organize their speech okay? or how the message got lost on you. You talk about that, but initially you're trying to build the foundational attributes for the speaker. When they get more advanced, yes, you will move in to the content. Nice. Okay. Oh, yeah, good question. Okay. Any other any other questions? Anything that was confusing? Yeah, I, I want to add on to what Ned mentioned, yes. uh, Lee. If I want to suggest to someone, hey, why don't you add a joke here, or right. you know, use the power of three to emphasize your message even further? Would that be? Yes. Uh, yeah. Definitely okay. do that. Definitely do that. What I'm saying is, here's what I'm talking about. How many times have you, you guys have gone to Toastmaster clubs and someone talks about their vacation and they went camping? And they talked all about camping and the evaluator comes up and talks about oh i liked your speech it reminded me and they go for the next three minutes talking about their camping experience was that an evaluation that is the type of content i'm saying don't get into the content get into how the speaker did the content and how it helped give the message across and if you could like what curdy was saying here's some content points that you could do i want you to put a little more humor in there to keep me more engaged with your with your speech, with your presentation. So yes, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you don't have to steer clear of all the content. I just don't want you focusing on the content. And some people say, someone does an icebreaker and they go, I wanted you to talk about this other thing. And I'm just thinking, why, that, that's such a dumb comment. The person crafted a speech so they can get up in front of the audience for the first time and just speak. They're trying to work on confidence. They're not really trying to give you an A plus speech. Some new Toastmasters do a really good icebreaker, but others, you're just getting them in the mode of getting in front of the audience. Why would you tell that speaker, I wanted you to talk about something else? Again, a ridiculous evaluation. So steer clear of that type of content type of of comment. It's not really inspiring to say something like that at all. Yeah. I mean, yeah, is that person going to want to get up and speak again? Ooh, I don't even know how to talk about myself. I talked about the wrong attributes of myself. Yeah, that's it's just crazy stuff. So this is where our officers of the club have to talk to these members and say, hey, you realize this is the first speech this person is doing, and you're just trying to encourage them and tell them what they did well and give a couple items for improvement, not to tell them they, they told about the wrong. How can you tell about the wrong content in an icebreaker? You can do whatever you want. So, okay. Uh, just uh, Lee, if you allow me to add something just to share with everyone. I think there is, I'm not sure if this is a tradition or it's something in the literature of the Toastmaster, but in the ice breaking speeches, they shouldn't be evaluated. Or if you evaluate them, you shouldn't come out with any negative exactly. comments. This is especially with the ice breakers because, you know, it's the first speech and you don't want to break the heart of the speaker here. Exactly. So there was, I don't know, is this a tradition or a rule in Toastmaster literature? So, so we evaluate everything in Toastmaster. Oh, okay. So icebreakers, again, right, you probably want to align an experienced Toastmaster to evaluate the, the, the novice speaker. And I would look to see where they are, if it's the icebreaker or if it's in the first couple of speeches that they're doing. I would say, okay, this person knows how to get in front of the audience. They look kind of confident now. Their organization is, is is pretty good, but they don't they're not doing vocal variety and I know that's coming up next. So I would talk about that. I like what you've done so far. Here's what I would say I want you to work for on your next speech. So you have to kind of gauge where they are. The icebreaker is all about making the speaker feel good. Make them feel good. Give them maybe one, two very small little concepts for improvement, but I would say just one. Just make them feel good that they did that. Applaud them for getting up in front of the audience. I look forward to your next speech. That's the goal of that speech, right? Toastmasters in their infinite wisdom picked the subject for the very first speech that we all do. And they picked a subject that we all know about, ourself. And they say, introduce yourself to the audience. But that is not the objective of that speech. The objective is for the speaker to get up in front of the audience the first time and start making this spot a comfort zone start developing and learning confidence so your evaluator better build up that confidence for that person right so i think we've we beat that horse to death all right let's go on zim 
We're going to do these really quickly. Here's another 10 point method. We know the primary goal. What's the primary goal? Get that speaker back up to speak again. Talk to the speaker prior to the speech, right? These are some of the same points. Know the basic speaking techniques, boom. Same thing, have the basic speaking techniques, boom. Evaluate, noting proficient in the improvements, putting the P's and the I's as you're going through. Keep on going. Prioritize the proficient I's as we put the second P, the second I. We deliver the sandwich method. So this is exactly the same as the other one. And then go to eight, nine, and 10. So eight is what? We're going to be personal. We're going to personalize our speech. We're going to be specific, be very specific, and last, be positive. So it's pretty much the same thing, just written in a different way. Okay, that is evaluation. And how are we doing here? We're doing pretty good on time. We're at about 8.30. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to push off table topics to a whole different session. Anybody care about learning about table topics? I think I'm looking at the audience here. It looks like pretty much advanced people. This was to help some of the clubs that go ahead, Christina. Oh, you you your thumb up? oh, just agreeing that. OK, here what you find up about table topics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the only point I want to make about we were, I was going to talk about the whole table topic session and this how it's not just the table topic master and the and the respondents, but the whole club gets involved. You get involved with the theme of the meeting and you keep the questions to the theme. This makes the table topics much more enjoyable. But what I do want to talk about table topics is this. We learned that great skill, as you saw in my science for a moment speech, table topics taught me how to think on my feet and write something very quickly. So that's a great skill. So I want you to continue doing that. The other point is it's a two minute speech. What is important about a two minute speech? We need to learn in our heads what two minutes of speaking time is based on how we speak. Why is that? Because every contest we go to has that two minute range, right? International, five to seven. Humorous, five to seven. Tall tales, three to five. So as soon as you get that green light, you should start knowing what two minutes is going to be like. Now, if that's too much for you to Try to remember, you should then figure out what one minute of speaking time means to you. So when you get that yellow light, you know you better start wrapping up in that one minute. And absolutely, I want everybody to learn what 30 seconds is like. You must know 30 seconds. If you're in the international speech contest and the red light comes on and you realize you have more speech than 30 seconds, you better figure out how to wrap that up in 30 seconds because if you do not, you have not bought one lottery ticket. You buy zero lottery tickets, you will never win the lottery. You buy one, you have exponentially increased your chance of winning. And if you don't get within the seven minutes and 30 seconds, you will never win the contest. So these are some concepts I wanted to bring up about table topics. It teaches us to think on our feet where we have to restructure a speech on the fly. It teaches us timing. So try to know what two minutes, one minute, or 30 seconds is. At least know some of those, right? 30 and one or 30 and two, it's going to help you as you become a competitor, right? And it's also good for us as speakers in Toastmaster meetings. We should value our audience's time. If we tell the club that we're gonna speak five to seven minutes and we speak nine to 11 minutes, what does that tell the audience? We did not practice. It tells the audience we didn't care about their time. We didn't respect them. That's what we're telling them when we do that. If you need nine to 11 minutes, tell the Toastmaster you need nine to 11 minutes. But eventually we have to learn how to do that five to seven minute speech because it's a great skill to know if you need, if you want to compete, okay? So learn, learn time. That's all I want to say about table topics. We can do a special session on table topics. We can do another full on session on evaluation down the road if you guys want to. And we'll take the summer off. And maybe in fall, we'll come back and we'll do instead of doing a series like this, we'll just do spot presentations. We'll do something on humor and comedy. We'll do something on storytelling. And we'll just announce it in Starbucks and you guys can sign up there. Okie doke. All right, if any clubs want something, you can always contact and we can do it that way as well. All righty, so I'm gonna give you guys time back. 
I'm going to turn it back over to Zim. I think Zim's got some closing comments, but let me leave you with this. I kind of mentioned this before. The whole point of this workshop is to know what we're trying to do as a speaker. And what is that? Deliver the message. We're going to write out the words. Our speeches are not just the words. And a lot of the people saw a lot of the contest speeches this last several months. And what we saw were people talking standing in front of the audience in the competition and just talking. They're just giving us words. A speech is crafted talk where you put in, where you remove all the extraneous stuff, where you organize it really well, as Becky was saying with Stark. Then we put in the figures of speech. We put in the humor. We put in the gestures. We put in the singing. We put in all of that extra stuff that entertains the audience. That is a speech that has been crafted. Don't we know a lot of people that talk, but don't say anything? We don't want talkers, we want speakers, and I want you all to be a speaker. So become a student of public speaking and continue to learn this craft for as long as it impassions you, and you will go far. And take your handouts and continue to lay them in front of you as you write, and continue to morph your speech and continue to put layer upon layer and have fun writing these speeches now because hopefully i've given you a whole different process that you're going to follow instead of just writing the words your voice is so powerful your physical presence is powerful the way you move changing up your voice and doing characters is really powerful figures of speech are amazing and that's why randy harvey in my view is the best of all the world champions because of what he did in his speech. And I could spend two hours dissecting his seven minute speech, which is really only six minutes and 50 seconds. He is amazing. I turn it back over to Zim. One second, one second, where are you going? We may not see you in a few weeks. We still have questions. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lee. Really, this was a very, informative and unforgettable workshop thank you this is the first time i am attending your workshop and i must say i'm impressed thank you very much yeah now a question for you because again this is maybe not related directly to what you said but it's related to toastmaster and public speaking it is something it's been uh, teasing my mind i've been a toastmaster for five years and i i'm facing uh, how can i say a dilemma with the contests because I still cannot understand the mechanism of winning. Okay. A lot of times I went for contests okay. and I see people, I don't like their speeches, but they win. Okay. Uh, like, I don't know. You tell me, you tell me your thoughts. Like you've been a Toastmaster for 30 years. Yes. Like what makes a loser win in a Toastmaster journey? Okay. I'm, I'm going to say this and I see people yeah. in this audience who I have I have coached and mentored. Okay. All I can do is teach the process. There are speech contests that I don't agree with either. And I, I don't, so here's what I was hoping. And this is why I think people need to come to evaluation workshops. And then the cousin of the evaluation workshop is the judging workshop. I have seen judges for years who I had never seen speak. When I first came to this district, I saw this one gentleman, I think for six or seven years, he was always holding up the ballot at the speech contest, area, division, district. After seven years at a division contest, he was asked to talk about the district contest and he stood up, he didn't go in front of the audience, he stood at his chair and he starts talking, he goes beat red, he fumbles over his words, and he was the most atrocious speaker I've ever heard, and this guy has been judging speakers for seven years. How can you judge speakers if you yourself have never gone into this contest and gone through that process of writing that five to seven minute speech and starting to win the different layers? So to answer your question, Ed, I think this is not for people like us in this in this venue, we are all trying to become better speakers. I think we need to address Toastmasters International. I know we have a past district governor looking at me right now, Sandy Malone. I don't know if this concept ever comes up when she goes to some of the trio trainings that they do, but so many people across many districts have these same comments about 
what makes a winning contest. Now, what Lance Miller says is you need to throw the 110 mile an hour pitch every time you speak, meaning there are not many major league baseball pitchers who can throw a 110 mile an hour pitch. But if you can and you throw it, no one's ever going to hit off of you. If you throw that type of a speech, you will always win because nothing will be compared to it, right? But still, if you have bad judges, and I've seen people in this room here that I've gone to contests where I thought they had won, and for whatever reason, the judges pick somebody else. And so all we can do is try to hone our craft and be the best speakers we can be, and then we need to train people how to judge. So what I want to do this next year is put on a judging workshop, and I will teach the basic speaking like this, just like I would do in an evaluation contest. The only difference between evaluation and judging is evaluation, you're going to stand up and talk to somebody about what they did. In and in a judging, you mark who you thought was the better speaker. You're comparing speak, speakers, right? But we have to teach our people how to judge because I think it's been a, a problem for many years, many different districts. And yeah. Thank you. So anyhow, it wasn't me. Like my feelings and analysis, it wasn't wrong. <laughs> like there is a problem with the process, with the judging process. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Thank you. And, and that and that's actually one of the issues I have with Toastmasters, right? Oh. We evaluate everything. Why do we not evaluate our contests? So yes. what I'm thinking is if you look at a boxing match, there's three there are three judges. Let's say there's five bouts. Each bout is is either is you give ten points to the winner, you give nine to the other person. So when you see that score at the end where it goes forty eight to forty seven, it's because of the way that the judges voted for the different contestants now some guy could have lost four rounds one of the boxers and in the fifth round he could knock the other guy out he wins right and that's the only way he'd be able to win okay there are some bouts where one of the contestants really knocks down the other guy so many times that they do the judging 10 to 8. so now the guy behind has to win more the point is at the end you hear the names of the three judges and you hear their score what I'd like to see if we have, let's say at the district conference, we have 10 judges. I'd like to see judge one through 10 and who they picked one, two, and three. And I think everybody should be able to see that. We don't need to know who the judges are, but we should see how they scored. And we go, wow, why is there such a big disparity here? How come everybody's picking these people to win? And then this other person picks somebody out of the blue to be first place. I mean, we should look at that stuff and go, this person should not be judging until they get trained because why is it so different? And then there may be biases where somebody likes one of the speakers and they thought it was a good speaker. So they give other speakers first, second, and third. That so-called good speaker was either first or second, but on one ballot doesn't even show up. That's a biased judge in my view, that they're pulling somebody out to not even give any points to them. So these are things we need as a collective group of Toastmasters to say, do we want to change this? Because I think there's nothing wrong with seeing all 10 scores of the judges. We don't know who they are, but we can see their scores. And I think that would help us as competitors, as well as people looking at the contest. So that's my take on, on judging. And that might actually uh, improve the judging too. I mean, yes. With that with the knowledge that they're they're going to be the results are going to be displayed for public yeah. viewing and, the, and the chief judge will know who's who and now it would be the chief judge job to go around to certain people and go okay we need you to go get training because you're a little bit off on your scoring right oh, yeah, indeed yeah. and ned and you said there is nothing wrong with you but we don't know you and there might be something wrong with you so i'm just saying well he knows camille so we already automatically know there's something wrong with him okay yeah <laughs> All righty. Well, thanks for coming here from your district, District 47, right, Ned? That you guys are in laughing. 42. 42. We are in, we are in Alberta, in Canada, in the southern part of Alberta and Saskatchewan. Oh, where, where, where? In in Calgary. Oh, okay. Do you know where Fairview, Alberta, is? Fairview. Uh huh. I hear about it, but Alberta is a big province. I know, it's south, it's south of Calgary. That's where my mom was born. Oh, really? Yeah. No, we are based in, in, in Calgary. It's like two hours yeah. from Montana. I know. My, yeah. I have family in Calgary. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. I do. And where are you now? Where am I? Like where are you? Yeah. yeah. 
I'm in Mukilteo, Washington. Oh, I see. Yeah, Washington is a beautiful state, also. It is. Uh, yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay. Any any final questions? I have one question. Yeah, go ahead, uh, similar lines as Ned. Um, so, if there are two contest speeches, one of them is more informational. The yep. other one is more inspirational, but both of them are very engaging and entertaining, let's say. Okay. Which one is more impactful in a speech contest? Right. Again, I know it will depend on the judges and everything. Right. Well, that, that's the trick, right? Um, you, you never know how the judges are going to view things. So that's why when we talked about topics, we talked about doing general topics that are universal. Talking about love, you shouldn't be offending anybody, right? So talking about overcoming hardship, we all can identify that. The stuff we talked about tonight in terms of the emotional connections, right? Talking about disappointment, talking about anger. Those are ideas that we all can identify with. It's really all about, I mean, if I was to be a judge, you know me, I'm going to be looking for all those little attributes. Oh, I like that there was alliteration. I like the simile. I like the humor. I like the the rhyme. I like the, the character voices. I liked, you know, I'm going to look for all kinds of attributes and I'm going to be giving points. It's just like the boxing match. Every time you touch the opponent, you get a point. If you do a significant strike, you get extra points. This is what I would do as a judge. But people in our district probably don't even know what alliteration is or even simile right so that's part of the problem so they just go based on their subjective of which speech did i like oh who had the better suit on today who knows what they're going for but i think we need to somehow make it more objectified and there's always going to be a component that is subjective right there are certain objectives that they should be giving points to and then then it's the eye test or the ear test how did i see or hear this which one touched me the most and then it's up to you to decide. So you're absolutely right. You could be comparing apples and oranges, but the one that's going to be the more emotional is the one that's going to draw more of the, of the vote, right? Because we are emotional, sentient beings. We are that middle brain. We are the mammalian brain, right? And then we go one step further and we have the human brain. The mammalian brain is sentient. We have the senses and we are all about the senses and emotion. So connect with them, connect with them, make them. Here's what I tell people. If in seven minutes you can make somebody cry and laugh, you need to be on the international speech contest because not many people in the world can do that. That is an art. Okay. I hope that answers your question, Curdy. I, I can't answer for, for judges. I don't know and how they've judged, but you know, I'm telling you how I would do it. I, I go for the pure speaking elements. I love it when I see a speaker do that. And when you look at Randy Harvey's speech compared to a lot of other champions, you will see all these different elements that we have talked about. He's a master storyteller. His family are storytellers. And it comes through. How many people do you know would do seven stories in six minutes and 50 seconds? I would never coach somebody to do that. So I've seen, I've, I've got with people, we've done four or five stories, but you know, you got to be really good. You have to get to the point and you got to connect. His shortest story is the one that had the most powerful line in it. That story about real men love for a lifetime, not just for a moment, is something on the order of like 25 seconds, that overall story. So his opening story is much longer. We connect with everything because his whole speech is about unconditional love that he learned from his father directly or indirectly watching his father take care of his mother. It's a beautiful speech. It's, it's amazing. When I saw that, I wish I could write something like that. It is so beautifully written that I can memorize it in very short order. It is so well-crafted. That's why that speech is so beautiful. And this is what we should aspire to do. Write beautiful speeches that when you write them, you can do them five years from now without even having to pick them up again because you've written them so well. And one word just leads into the next. It's beautiful. It's poetry. It's an art form. And that's where I want all of you to do. I want to see all of you competing. And I'll say, I know those people, right? 
I know those people. Okay, any other questions? We're doing the Q&A now. So when we're done with Q&A, we'll let Zim, oh, Zed, Ned, go ahead. Uh, I was thinking if I should ask or no, but you, you caught me, okay. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if this is supposed to be asked here, but I'm, I want to talk and to share with us your experience about public speaking in general as a career. Okay. Is it something really worth? Um, I, I don't know. I, I, I like again, it's for not for now, for a future, like after retirement or something. But is it all you? I like, I personally, I love public speaking, but I, I look at it as a passion. Right. But can one day this passion be monetized? Can it, it, I don't know what, like what, how you see the future of public speaking? Let me put it so short. Is yeah. it a, a career with a good future or no? There is a, there is a career in a future with public speaking. A lot of people do it. A lot of champions go off and do it. Not all of them, but some of them do. And what they do is they sell a product and a service. They sell you material that you can buy and they also sell coaching. And they're, they're fairly expensive, but like, like what you said, Ned, for me up until this point in my life, it's just been a passion and I didn't want to make it like work. But at this point, a lot of people are coming to me to coach them. And a lot of people have come to me. I've had people after I've spoken and they've come up to me and I said, oh yeah, the person I admired the most, this is back when I was in LA, I said was Don Johnson. And he won in 1989, he was a world champion. And the, the lady I was talking to looked at me really weird. And she goes, oh, I'm taking a class with him right now at UCLA. And I go, yeah, I heard he teaches a class at UCLA. And she looks at me really puzzled. She goes, oh, I think you're a much better speaker than him. And that was the first time anybody ever said anything on that level to me. And this is back, I'd only been in Toastmasters maybe about six or seven years, but he was my idol. And to have someone say I was better than my idol just blew me away. I'm thinking there's something wrong with this lady. She must not have, <laughs> she must not be, she must not be paying attention to, to Don, Don Johnson, right? Yeah. And then another time here in Seattle, I went to a club and at the end, this lady came up to me. She goes, I've been in the NSA for 20 years. I've never heard anybody speak like you before. And so now people are, then people in my clubs are coming up to me saying, you're going to be the world champion someday. So I'm getting this kind of same feedback, right? And then I went to do this, uh, I was helping do Toastmaster clubs in Silicon Valley because I was traveling there so, so much. And people were coming and see, hearing me speak and they were asking me to come to their clubs. And I would have to say, well, I actually live in Seattle, but if we can arrange a time that you want me to come in a few weeks, I can plan a trip. And so this one lady, set something up, they do it all through Meetup, and 85 people show up to hear me speak. And it was all about memorable messages through storytelling. And she was saying, I want you to do it at a really high level. And you see how I teach, right? I, I, I start at the basics and I build it up. I don't assume the audience knows anything. And so at the very beginning, I polled the audience. I said, how many of you are not in Toastmasters? Did you say how many of you? Or did you say, have you ever? There you go. There you go. I said, you're right. So I'm talking to the audience. I said, who here is not in Toastmasters? And 65% of the hands of the audience went up. If I, I knew right away, I've gone to advanced clubs and I have to teach the basics before I get to the advanced concept. So I speak there for, I, I did the whole thing on the triune brain and really got into it because I knew Silicon Valley, they love all the technology. And some guy at the end comes up to me shaking his head. He's going, dude, you can make a killing. I've never heard anybody speak like that before, right? And he was talking about all these startup companies need to sell their story and you need to connect with them on the cerebral level. On the, on the, I talked about the why a lot. I talked about how the brain works. So there is a way to make money. I just have not pursued it. So I'm probably not the guy to talk to about it, but look up Mark Brown and Darren LaCroix. They do sessions all the time. Go to one of their free webinars and talk to them about monetizing. Contact Craig Valentine. Um, I was surprised. I, I pinged him the other day on Google and it says he's worth $15 million. Darren LaCroix was worth $900,000. I don't know how that works out, um, but I don't know if Craig Valentine has some other business or something, but that's what that says, right? 
So I know these people go out and they charge money. So you need to talk to them. How yeah, but Jay, you're wearing a suit. You look like you're worth a million bucks already. You feel leave. like a million bucks, you know? <laughs> I'm going to go deposit yeah. myself in the bank. All right. Thank you for those kind. I'll give you the $5 later, Sandy. Thanks. All right. I think we're running. We're, we're two minutes to nine o'clock. I wanted to get hey, to Can I just ask a quick question? This is yes. Don. Don. Um, uh, I should show you my face. Um, I was just wondering, I know, I believe you said that some of this material that you've given to us that we can use it or adapt it. Because, because I have to, I think in about three weeks, give a speech at my Calgary club on vocal variety, especially after we did um, the last class, how you started it with that one sentence. I thought it was very important that they, to get that message across. No, about how you use your voice so. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I, I'm, I'm going to be using some of that then. Thank you. Yeah, here's how I look at this. There's 350,000 people right now in Toastmasters in a world of 7.8 billion. Do I really care if you guys take my material? You're not going to make a dent in the world. So, like I said, I want you to grow. If this helps you grow, Don, to teach vocal variety and learn it by teaching it, and you can teach others, do it. We're trying to make better communication a worldwide reality. And if people have to be charged to be a better communicator, we have already lost. So help people become better communicators. I am not worried about you guys taking my material. Just don't go copyright it. Use it as much as you like, and I'm fine with it. Okay, it helps you grow, helps others grow. There we go. All right. I'm going to turn it back over to Zim. If you have any other questions, feel free to send me emails. And we'll go, but I think Zim has a couple of closing comments and you guys have a great summer. A oh, round of applause for Lee. Yay, Lee. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for sticking through it, you guys. Thank you. Lee, well, that was fabulous. Um, it's very generous of you to share your wisdom and knowledge and all the gold that you found with us. I think when we began this journey and we all came together to meet you at the road, and we stopped at the village. I don't think any of us were quite expecting what we got. And I wanted to share with you where we started because part of this was um, to be able to bring a new club to life. And that was Constructive Communicators. And so this uh, workshop was brought by three clubs, um, Constructive Communicators, Speak Out, as well as Seriously Funny. And we now actually have a um, charter club and these are our, our new members. And the, we're meeting at this time, um, at the time that for uh, Constructive Communicators. And if you are into this routine of coming, dropping by every second and fourth Wednesdays at seven, continue to come to this club. We love to have you as a member or come as a guest and practice with what you have uh, been given. And just, and you see Lee's name there, he is part of this club. So you'll get to see him and ask him more questions. Um, I would love for you to do that. I think part of this journey is um, the story that Lee told us about meeting at the the pathway from and looking down to see where we want to go. And with that, there are droppings of nuggets that we have collected on the path that we as a collective whole have chosen to follow. And this brings us to that enlightened village that Lee talked about in his first session. So all of us have been given this gift and I would consider that we have a knowledge that is pretty specialized and pretty valuable that probably many of the Toastmasters are not aware of. And I would like you to be able to think about how many nuggets do you need to make yourself a competent speaker that you could feel good about standing in front of an audience and sharing your story. And not just to share the story, but to, to touch them and say, you know what, through my story, I care about you. 
and I want to get to know you just as much as you just got to know me. And I think that's really important because why would we wanna tell a story after all, right? If we didn't want to move the other person or touch them in a certain way. So how many nuggets do you need? Lee has given you gold bars. Is that enough to get you to where you need to go? Is that enough to buy your ticket to the next step? But wait, not all of us are gifted to be story writers or to be evaluators or even to be speakers. So it's really important that you recognize where your gift is and what skills you want to use. If you aspire like Ned and wants to inquire about speaking and making a larger dent in the world, do it. But if, if, if you're not the speaker, but you're the evaluator or the speech writer and you want Ned to get there, share some of your gold with him. We're in this together, right? If we want to change the way that judging contests are done and actually encourage people who have the potential to be up there, don't use your skills as an evaluator to be a judge or encourage others, share the wealth that you have. And so I, I really encourage you to focus on the strength that you have, the gifts that you've been given and see where you can go with it. Sometimes we're here to help others and sometimes others are here to help us. The only way we're gonna get further down the road is if we can go together. So as our road diverged tonight, you are more than welcome to come back here in two weeks time to a regular club meeting. You are also welcome to come back to the road when it, when it comes together, when our cross path again at the next session that we will host either on table topics or an evaluation or advanced workshop. But know that the nuggets are yours to keep do something with them, invest in them, okay? Gold is solid, so it's gonna sink if you don't invest it and you know how much gold is worth. So I'm really grateful that you've all stayed tonight and many of you stayed for the four sessions. I hope you found it significant and meaningful and found some wisdom. And thank you, Lee so much for being so generous to share this gift with us and not only to inspire and to encourage but i think just to share the love and the support and to teach us about ourselves how our brain works how our heart feels and mostly that hey it's okay to be yourself and just talk hello with that Thank you so much, everyone. I hope you have a fabulous summer and I hope to see you again. And I look forward to your next speech. Thanks, Zim. Big, big thanks to Anu and Zim. Thank you, Zim. Thank you, Thanks, Sandy. Thanks, Camille. Yeah, thanks, thank you, Zim. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Until next time. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Bye, Ned. You will see.